And we're live. Kia ora, everybody. This is our uh, malfunction from Foray. Um, Privileged to have um, sit down with, well, myself sit down here and Rob sit down wherever he is over in the US. Uh, Mr. Rob Anderson from uh, Underground. Sorry. It's around. We're, we're from Florida. Uh, Written Sense Comics, uh, Devilish Comics, Barbara's Blog. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let um, Rob tell you everything else because otherwise I'll miss something out and feel like an idiot. Go, Rob. Uh, it's not your fault. I do a ton of stuff. I do a lot. I'm across the gamut. Uh, for those who don't know me, I come from Florida. I grew up in New York, so if you're if you're hearing a little bit of New York and how I'm talking, yes, just like in the movies, we actually sound like this. Uh, I am um, a creator, like everyone else, that uh, I'm sure you guys are going to see on this show. But the, the things I create are about fetish monsters and more. And one of those more things is a comic book about a farting elephant that teaches morals. Another one is about a young woman journeying through the New York City fetish underground. And as a matter of fact, it's like Fifty Shades of Grey. If an adult had written it, they knew what they were talking about. I also create books about monsters, but more importantly, and, and how I meet a lot of people is my work that I do to advocate for comics. I advocate mm -hmm. for the creation of comics and the creators behind them because it's important that we actually have this, I don't know, com not community. Community is a wrong word. So that's like friends coming together, but an industry. That's more important, an industry yeah. that works together and helps each other out. A lot of people don't realize that Walmart and Target actually work together on some things. It's a mm -hmm. hidden thing that they do behind the scenes. It's the computers. It's the different registers they use. All of them share information. That's why you see the same registers everywhere. So that's mm -hmm. what we need to do with comics. We need to start listening to each other more and stop talking at each other. So, mm -hmm. and, um, it, you know, it's one of those things. And I, I'm happy to be here and answer any questions. Uh, I'm uh, from Florida. So uh, if you guys have any questions about New York and Florida, let me know. <laughs> So how long have you been in comics out like as a as an ind independent creator? Ooh, it, it, the real answer is I've been doing it for over 15 years, but I've only published my stuff as of 6 years ago now. And the reason for that is like many indie creators, there well first off when I started there was no Kickstarter and you you paid a lot more for comics and it wasn't what it was. This was before MCU blew up. And as it started to blow up, I actually got very, um, I started to getting promoted at my, uh, my regular job. And I wound up having the ability to get paid more. So when you're making good money, you kind of put the other stuff to the side. And then yeah. a back injury that wind up leaving me crippled suddenly made me pay attention to comics a lot more. And it made me very inspired yeah. to tell my stories. So I've been the advocate for comics now for five years. But I've been around for 15 and I've watched this industry grow. And a lot of people don't realize how much I know about it. I know a lot because I know the right people to ask questions to. So um, you told, what was your regular job before you got into comic books? I believe it or not, I worked in retail as a manager. I worked in uh, different companies. Uh, the last company mm -hmm. I worked with was Costco. So I know, and you know what? All in all, it was a good company. It's just a fluke accident that uh, wound up yeah. hurting my back. I blame more uh, workman's comp because here in America, we don't have universal health care. And it's kind of a joke how they treat people. And I yeah. wound up not getting treated right now. I will spend the rest of my life having uh, spinal issues. So nothing mm -hmm. against. It's just, I, you know, the bad break, literally. <laughs> Both of us uh, are kind of like in the similar vein. I, I was in a car accident, so I have a back injury and a neck injury. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm on like medical. Yeah, uh, it's been a while. So, and that sort of pushed me into comics as, as well, which is, you know, because it meant that I, I, I was stuck at home. What do I do? What do I do? And I think, you know, that's, when, that's what you usually start questioning, isn't it? When, you, when you're like, you're so, when you're limited by your regular means of just being able to get out and just get a job where you can find one. But when you then you when you come to a crisis and you go, I can't do that regular thing. What do I do? What do you found yourself doing as well? I completely agree. You you kind of have that moment where it's like, well, I don't have my body. How can I use my mind? And mm -hmm. comic books. Hopefully, we all hope we're going to make money. There's a rumor that you make money from comics. I don't know <laughs> if that rumor is true. I'm still trying to discover if that rumor is true. But no, I mean, this is something I owe comic books my ability to read. I was born with dyslexia, and I've always had trouble reading because of dyslexia. 
And if it weren't for being inspired by comic books, I would have never learned how to read the way I know how to read. So, you know, it's one of those things where I love comics. Everything I do is out of love for comics. And it's, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to, even when I was doing the day job and I had the day job, I was going to New York Comic Con, I was doing the panels, I was learning and moving on from everything that was going on. So, you know, this is something that's always going to be in my blood and it's always going to be something I want to do. Even when I was a little kid, I wanted to tell stories. So, um, do you work, uh, do you do it as a writer or as an artist? Oh, I definitely can't be an artist in the traditional sense of actually drawing. Mm -hmm. I just don't have that eye-hand coordination. Um, I don't want to blame dyslexia or anything. I just wasn't given the talent. I can do doodles, and that's about it, and those aren't yeah. even great. Um, I will say that I do do behind-the-scenes work. As you see all the graphic work behind me, that's all my yeah. stuff being put together. I can letter. It, it, it takes a lot, and you'll know this from having the neck injury because I have some neck problems, mm -hmm. too. Anytime you sit too long at a desk, your neck hurts and it winds up yeah. giving headaches. And people don't understand it unless you have a neck injury. And I part of this wound up leading to a bad neck injury because I was having such bad spasms, my head would kick back. And when it would kick back, yeah. it wound up crushing a little bit of discs, leaving me with a herniated disc. And mm. it's just it's constant pain. Yeah. So, you know, writer, it's a you can write on your phone nowadays. You can yeah. dictate with your your vocal cords. There's a lot more you can do than an artist who has to be over the thing. So if I was ever going to be an artist, the time has come and passed. I give credit to any artist with a back injury or a neck injury that's still out there doing it because it's almost impossible for me to be, like when I do the longer videos and I do the interviews, you'll start to notice after a couple hours I'm leaning back. I can't, yeah. you know, my neck just becomes too heavy for my, my big head and <laughs> it becomes an issue, so... There's something that like, I think um, I try, you know, like uh, after uh, probably after a decade, I don't talk about it much openly, but like there is a time when like uh, the body affects how you, um, how much output you can put out. And do you ever find that you're putting out too much and you don't realize it until the day after or the night? Oh, I pay the price all the time. Mm -hmm. There are suddenly mornings I wake up and I can't get out of bed. And you can hear yeah. my little kid, Jax, he's five. There are mornings he literally drags me out of bed. He'll grab my arm. And he's a very sweet kid, and I give him a lot of credit. He does realize there are certain days that daddy is just feeling it. And he has to just be patient with me. And I got real lucky in the draw when it came to kids because he will do that. He'll he'll just lay on the bed right next to me, and he'll wait till I can get up. And, you know, you, you have a back injury. You know, you have to take that deep breath and feel that first bout of pain to even get out of bed. Yeah, you're like, what did I do yesterday? That's always the first thought is what did I do yeah. yesterday? Because you never want to do it again. It's like a hangover for your body. The weird thing is like if um, you want to do more, right? But you're limited with your time and stuff. And it's like, I'm going to do this. I can't do this. Um, how do I do it? So Have you been, you know, after so, um, so many years, have you been, um, how long has it been since your injury? Two thousand. Believe it or not, I got hurt on, you, you'll laugh at this, January 3rd of 2013. So I literally got hurt on 1-13-13. So like, oh my God, it was just, and then you, it's, it's okay. So I got hurt on 0, zero one zero three thirteen. right? Then I yeah. sent me back to work because in America we have workman's comp. Send me back to work. Which my doctor already said you needed emergency surgery after they had the surgery a year later. Mm -hmm. They send me back to work, and then I—I'm not even kidding here. On the on a Friday the thirteenth, I go mm -hmm. to. I think it was a Friday. It was definitely the thirteenth. I go to open up a, a truck bed when I probably shouldn't have been doing this because I was back and receiving. A pallet falls on the truck door and it yanks my back, and that was it. That that was the end. And bone went to bone, and bone spurs shot into my spine. And yeah. they were up there for a year. So uh, what is that? Seven years ago now. Seven years. Mm -hmm. of, and it, since that, I always say it since that day. And you know this from having a neck and back injury. You're in pain every day. It never yeah. ends. They're just better days. And you can't stress that yeah. enough to people. Like some people will be like, oh, you look like you're in pain. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's accurate. I'm always going to be in pain. That's not going away. Yeah, it's weird. It's like, oh, uh, it's 24 hours, mate. <laughs> you know, it's 24 hours. It's like yesterday, I just, um, I think on Sunday, I did a lot. And then yesterday, I slept. 
It's like, I don't remember yesterday. Like, yeah. where did the day go? I woke up probably about 13 hours later, maybe, and then I'm straight into this for the last, I think, since about maybe, I can't even remember when. I just started doing stuff because you got to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, how did you, you know, being a writer, now that you 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 the injury in 2013, uh, 14, and then you start thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. How did you decide comics are the things you're going to do? Well, I was always doing comics before this, remember. Okay. So before the injury, I was already doing comics. I was already planning. I'd already written stories. I still have stories mm -hmm. I want to tell from that period. I'm actually releasing a book sometime this year. Uh, you know yeah. how complicated this year has been. But sometime this year, I will get out what is going to be called The Devil's Tales. And that is going to be a, basically all my earlier works with some of new work, yeah. some poetry, all put together in a short story format. So mm -hmm. it, it, I'm, I'm taking the old and mixing it with the new, and I'm letting people see my journey as a creator because yeah. you have so many of these ideas. And uh, I even lost uh, – there. we had a flood down here in our garage after a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And it wound up costing me a hard drive that had over 150 stories that I'd written years ago. And I know a yeah. lot of that because it fried, you know, water and hard drives don't mix well. No. So, I dropped a PDA in a doctor's office. Yeah. yeah. I was writing, I was writing like, I was onto like, I had this amazing story going, going, going. And I was like, oh, it's your turn now. Woke well, up. Done. That was that. And it's, it's, I always like. I always keep telling the guys that when we're on here to actually always write down whatever thought you're thinking, put it down because you don't know when you're going to need it, mm -hmm. uh, or when you need a storyline or when you need a plot. So when you started, um, how did you go about getting artists involved into your um, into your comics writing? Uh, it was the hardest thing in the world, to be honest with you, at first. I would go to New York Comic Con, hear about all these people who wanted to work, and then they wouldn't work with me. I couldn't get anyone to work with me. I felt like I had the uh, cooties, the creator cooties. Yeah. And um, I finally just made a book on my own, which uh, took the idea of, okay, I want to write a story about a vigilante. Let's talk about the vigilante city. And why yeah. does the city need a vigilante? So what I did is I used yeah. headlines from newspapers to tell a story. And I made this mm -hmm. whole comic book, and the people who saw it thought it was a genius idea, but it wasn't yeah. good enough to sell, but they loved the creativity in it. So they gave me an idea, and they said, okay, well, I want to see what you could do. Hooked me up with some artists. The artists fell through, mm -hmm. but I yeah. still was like determined to do the work. So after back surgery, this is right after back surgery. This is going to be my third comic. For two years, I, I brought back the same comic as the injury because I started right before I had the injury, and then I got the injury, so that stalled a year of creativity which is understandable, but I had major back surgery. They fused the bottom a uh, du uh, dual fusion. I created a comic book using art. I actually drew a comic book and it was one of the most difficult right. processes I ever had. Um, to this date, it is one of the biggest accomplishments I ever did. So I'm proud of the mm -hmm. fact that in those moments I was able to create a comic book. It was four pages, nothing major, but I did four yep. pages. Now someone else was supposed to work on me on the other side also bailed out of me. And I knew my art wasn't strong enough to do eight pages of my art. People would throw it away. But if I could do something unique, I could get away with it. So what I did is I, I had a lot of background in photography. I actually took an action figure and used mm -hmm. an action figure to showcase an entire uh, four-page story. And it's one yeah. action figure in different positions. And at the end, I actually set the action figure on fire. So you can yeah. actually get to sort of see, and I have videos of the process and stuff that got ruined, unfortunately, because of the hurricane. But it was a long yeah. process for me, and I was very proud of it. And to this date, it's it's probably the best accomplishment I've ever had. Hmm. So tell us about um, about your work before going to Barbara Unleashed with Oncoms. Uh, Oncoms is, well, I mean, it's, it's the response, right? Like, we can't just sit here and do nothing. We're not Marvel and DC. We can't put our pens down. Indie creators can't afford to stop working right now. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to cultivate the market, find a way to stay relevant. So I, I decided to do an online, as soon as Emerald City Comic Con canceled, and they said yeah. they were going to do something. When I got home that day, I said, you know what, everyone, here's what I'll do. I'll do an online garage. We'll do a garage con. And uh, yeah. the Project Con, we'll get some creators together who are going to go there, and you all hang out with me, and we'll do an online Comic Con. And remember, mm -hmm. at this point, my website, IndieAdvocates.com, has been known as the Global Digital Comic Con for four years. 
this is our fifth year actually going by that moniker. So okay. it was nothing new to me to do these online things. It was just this one. We we're going to make a little bit more massive. We we're going to invite more people at once. It was going to be a two day, three day block for because on StreamYard you can only go three hours. So it was like a three hour and then a three hour. So it was six hours over a weekend. And I figured we'd do it one time and we'd be done with it and not think anything of it. Week of the bad news starts coming in. More closures, yep. more quarantine. This is not going away. This won't be a one week. So I'm like, yeah. right before Garage Con, I'm like, okay, well, this is an online Comic Con, but it's not really a convention, is it? Because we don't have a convention center. We're really not doing a convention. This is an online connection to the fans. And I was like, oh, what a cool, fun play of words. What if we did on con, C-O-N-N, -N, for connections mm -hmm. instead of conventions? And OnCon was born, and, and slowly but surely we started. And you've been on a couple of the panels mm. that we have had. Uh, we, They're we really had cool, right? The, I mean, that's what got me started to do this. It was like, wow, this is just really cool. Yeah, and, and that, that became the point, just entertaining people, making sure people didn't feel so alone. Like every night mm. around this time, I usually go live to tell people that, you know, you're not alone. And I'll do it when we're done mm. with this interview, no problem. Sometimes I tell yeah. them, sometimes I might be late. But they, they always know that there will be something. We have uh, people showing up. And I know you've occasionally said, hey, I'd be on that panel. And I'm in the middle of the panel, so I can't keep up with everything that's going on. Yeah. But, you know, we, we get that. A lot of people who do want to come on the panels. And we've had a great group. We've had over 30 creators show up to all the different things. For a while, I was keeping up on the weekend doing it on con. But then I realized yeah. everyone else was doing it. It was no longer something unique. And I was like, you yeah. know what? I'm going to back out and stop doing it. And suddenly I got invited to do other ones. And they were like, hey, yeah. you come do this. And I was like, sure, you know, why not be on some other platform? Why not just mm -hmm. be part of a conversation? I, and you can tell today you were like, hey, you're free. And I'm like, what time? And I tried to make it work with you. I was like, yeah, yeah. I got a, inter I got a, we got a panel here, but reach out to me. And now I'm here. Because it's, what's most important to me is you, the fans, you, the readers, you, the listeners. Even if you're not yeah. My stuff, I could be promoting. I mean, you got your Sunspot magazine coming out soon. What we're going to be talking about a lot on our site and promoting, and it's all about creators helping the industry grow. Because mm -hmm. right now, that's what we need. We were staying at home to be safe, but we we can't give up. And especially yeah. now, with comics in such dire straits as an industry, we need innovators. So you know, if I if someone says I'm doing something I'm, and they will offer me an opportunity, I'll be there. I'll do my part, do my little dance, and I'll go and do my thing on my own thing. You know, it's working together, getting, you know, getting the ball moved down the field. I was, I was just talking about uh, Stan Lee earlier when I was talking about like the um, Neil Gaiman and um, and Todd McFarlane with the Angela thing, and you know the how they you know had a problem with there, but and about movies, but. Um, you know, Dan Lee for probably about 30 years was running to Hollywood saying, come, come and see what the great stories we have to write about, what we're doing. Look at all these great work that you can translate into movies. Nobody wanted a piece of it. Nobody wanted a bar of it. And suddenly, 2000, uh, was it 2010? Uh, Feige, uh, I'm sorry, um, I can't remember his name now. Feige? He, uh, sorry? Feige? No, uh, the other guy who played, uh, who was actually in Iron Man. Oh, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, hold on. I'll call you know, he, I know what you're talking about. he directed Iron Man and got it out there. And he, everybody's like, comic books, comic books, comic books. But this is like for us now, isn't it? It's like indie, 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 because we all, we're all saying, hey, look, we got a lot, of, a lot of things to do. But the great thing about it now, we're all stuck at home. As uh, one of my mentors said, uh, I interviewed this weekend, she doesn't realize she's a mentor, but she's a mentor. That you know, how do we go forward with this in the situation when you're stuck at home? Uh, there's new ways of innovating and uh, meeting people and connecting with audiences and and maybe customers, maybe uh, patrons, maybe actual people who promote you across other platforms like we've just done here, because everybody's stuck to their to their screens now. Mm -hmm. And it. And it's do you think this is a, you know, do you feel this is a great opportunity because we're stuck in the situation or? I think it's a great opportunity if you let it be a great opportunity and don't make it about yourself. We're seeing a lot yeah. of creators trying to just make it about them. Like you'll see people doing interviews and yeah. all they do is talk about themselves while the other person who's a, a guest 
just sits yeah. there and kind of watches them talk about their life. And I've been yeah. on shows like that, and there's nothing more annoying than wasting my time. And you've been on my panels. I try to keep the discussion moving. Everyone gets a fair amount of time. We don't have time yeah. for the topic. Nope, we're done. Because it's you, you really want to be part of something. And to be part of something, you got to mm -hmm. share space. That's just what it is. I know they're talking about social distancing. We have to learn how to do that when we're on shows as guests. Yeah. Just ourselves from the, the instant knee-jerk reaction of, I have to answer right now. You really don't. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is carry a pad. Have a pad right yeah. for you. Write down some things, and that's it. You yeah. know, I, I do it all day. This is me writing from all the panels. You know, we're talking now. I had taken notes with John Favre. That was his name, John Favre. He that's was it. Yeah, man. Favre, and, yeah. And he, like you said, he kickstarted something amazing by instantly mm. trying to work with other people, not work against them. He tried to team yeah. up, and of course, we know that didn't turn out well for him. He wound up going his own way. But now he brought us Baby Yoda. This man is a genius. Yeah. And I think that's that's where, I mean, this this whole networking and across the world, this is the weird thing. It's like it's not like just a couple companies, you know, approaching other people. It's actually all of us approaching each other across the world and, you know, sort of guiding. That's the thing that, I mean, like when I was watching, um, you know, come on with um, constant, Constances, you know, gave me the link. I popped up. You said hello, and you know, next thing you're guiding me on how to do my Sunspot magazine properly, because I was new to it, didn't know what I was doing, and I took that on board and went away. So that was great guiding on it because I realized that, yep, listen to this because these guys are actually doing it. They know how to do it, and I want to be successful. And how do I do it? Follow advice, and um, that's one of the things that I think you. Is really great about what you guys are doing is you're actually giving us a lot of good advice. We try. I mean, <laughs> sometimes we get told we don't know what we're talking about. But that, I mean, look, we're, if we can't learn from each other, who are we going to learn for? The big boys ain't trying to give out the secrets because they know that we'll use the secrets and we'll, we'll take it yeah. and be successful. So within creators, we try to help each other as much as we can. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. just small things, even when it comes down to like just having that other set of eyes is so yeah. valuable it's, it's it's having that outside point of view and if you if you find people are just going to bash you then you're with the wrong people but if people and you know my method is well let me ask you how does this look to you when i notice yeah. something, i like to point it out to a person when a person looks at it they're like oh i can see what you mean that helps yeah. them as opposed to being just someone who's like you're stupid you don't know what you're doing because we all yeah. have that bad mentor or we shouldn't even call him a mentor just that bad operator mm -hmm. who has done things yeah. And, and even discouraged us. I've had people, you know, when they looked at my first book, I had someone go, oh, this is horrible. And it was horrible, but it was something I made while I had a broken back. And if I had taken that too seriously, I might not have be where I am today. But instead, I had someone, Victor Dandridge, great guy, does you create comics for kids, amazing creator on his own with uh, his amazing tale of the trouble with love. So I, very great guy. I was in a wheelchair. He looks at the book. Because I wasn't allowed to be at that con without a wheelchair that year at New York mm -hmm. Comic Con. Looks at it and goes, this is great. He's like, I'm actually jealous. You you actually used action figures to tell a story. He's like, yeah. you're going to make something of yourself. And he lifted mm -hmm. me up in that moment when I was stuck in a wheelchair. And you don't forget mm -hmm. that. You always try to give that back to people. And some of it's going to be harsh. You know, because some yeah. people need that harsh answer. Um, sometimes you get someone who, I, I'll give a quick example. Uh, this mm -hmm. one kid was trying to get on my show for the last six months. I didn't think he was ready for the prime time between me and you and who's ever watching. He just yeah. didn't seem polished enough. But, you know, I want to give new creators a chance, but he I'd seen him on other shows and he had a tendency to be a smart ass and say whatever came to his mind. That's not a show I want anyone on. I want people to yeah. be open, be honest, but don't say things to try to rub people the wrong way. That's not how you're going to get. Them. <laughs> so I finally found a couple panels that I thought he could fit in. And even if he ran his mouth, he wouldn't get in trouble How about TV yeah. and TV. Like, you, it doesn't matter. Everyone's got a bad uh, point of view when it comes to it, depending on how you're looking at it. So yeah. I invite him on, and I literally tag him in a post. And he, mind you, he'd been tagging me in things for over a year now. Things I didn't need to be tagged in, but I never got mad about it. I shared when I thought it was a, 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 a pliable to share it, and it would help an audience. Because remember, I have to look at what my audience is viewing as well. So I have yeah. to monitor what I'm giving them. So, you know, I, I tag him in this thing being nice. He's like, excuse me, why am I tagged in this? And I'm like, what? I was like, I thought you were a professional comic book creator who wanted to be on a show, on a show giving advice. I'm sorry. I won't tag mm -hmm. anything anymore. He's like, oh, well, yeah. You know, 
I just want to know why people are asking me for things. And I, 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 I deleted it on Facebook and I went to his messenger and I lit him up yeah. and I gave him the reality. You don't spend yeah. a year asking six months to a year asking to get on someone's show. And then when they give you an opportunity, spit in their mm-hmm. face. I can't trust this to enough, uh, enough of you people, listen of uh, people, persons, whatever, whatever the proper terminology is, because we're always in trouble in America, no matter what we say. Yeah. For anyone with ears will go that way. There's no losing with that. Man. Except for the one person without an ear. I don't have ears, you yeah. bastard. But <laughs> okay, they can't. There's also someone out there with some issue on their shoulder that they got to complain about. Yeah, but they can't hear me. They don't have ears, so I'm I'm safe. <laughs> as long as they don't translate this with any any way, we're fine. <laughs> you know, for those who are listening, seriously, kidding around aside, um, t- PR, professional and respectable. Always yeah. do that. show people respect. Be respectable, professional. Mm-hmm. Always act as if your job is on the line when you're publicly speaking. And that doesn't mean you can't be passionate. I've been in boardroom meetings where I've said some things that you probably shouldn't have said, but I believed in them, and it earned Mm. a lot of credit. And remember, I was getting promoted in my career despite having a little bit of a bad attitude. You know, and I'm just honest. I'm I'm open to conversation. I I just Mm -hmm. agree with people. I'm I'm from New York. That means I'm passionate about everything. Everything's about it. That's just New York, you know. Like you get, you talk to me about pizza, it'll be a five-hour conversation, and I'll get red-faced at one point, being like, "What are you talking about, Chicago pizza?" Like just all red coming in. But that's just how we are. That's New York for you. But yeah. it's passion, especially when it comes to comic books. And I, I don't think mm-hmm. people put enough passion in what they're doing. They just expect, like, look, I made a comic. Like this is exactly the attitude. Here, I made a comic. Read it. Buy it. And <laughs> no, no. Yeah. no. I say it all the time. It's it's like they're on a date. Oh, here comes Nick. <laughs> He's yelling. Um, so yeah, it's it's about a date. And let, ooh, uh, let me ask you, how did it feel the first time you were you were having someone read it? Your work, right? Like that's you want someone to read it, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't if you don't believe in it yourself, why should anybody else give you the time? You know, I think. It really comes down to, especially if if you don't believe in yourself, then there's no point. Um, and, and I think that's something that I, I listened to when you guys were discussing it about on um, on stream just before I was listening to, uh, and um, about someone basically uh, doing the same thing, saying, should I actually, you know, put this out there or not? And the guy was saying, well, no, because you don't actually believe in it. And um, I think that goes for anything, really. Um, if you don't believe in what you're doing, then why are you doing it? And, um, I mean, apart from paycheck, if you're doing anything creatively, you have to believe in what you're doing and be passionate about it. And um, if you're not, you're wasting everyone's time. You're wasting your own. Unless you're a talented yeah. person. Let me tell you, there are artists who are very talented who do what they do, mm-hmm. and they go home. But yeah. you can't do that when you're on your own in indie comics. Artists can get away with it more than writers because the writers are the ones financing all this stuff. Like, it's easy to do fan art, not judging, just being honest. Mm-hmm. I make a picture of Captain America. It looks good. I might be able to sell that. But if yeah. I want to sell a book you've never heard of, like Cat Dad and Supermom, I have to sell yeah. it to you. I have to I have to get you engaged. I can't just be like, again, comic here, bye. That's not yeah. how this works. And so many creators make that, that early mistake of, well, I made a comic. Do you know how hard it was? You should buy my book. No, they shouldn't. You have to sell them. And I always equate yeah. it to dating. Every person who shows up at your table is someone you want to date. It's not the way that you normally date them. Instead, you're dating in fandom. Because let's be yeah. honest, fandom is a relationship that's much like dating, and it can end quickly. We see that yeah. all the time, even with Star Wars. A lot of, a lot of ex-girlfriends for Star Wars these days. You know, yeah. a lot of people mad at Star Wars, and that's because they stopped respecting the relationship, and they tried to do something that was weird, and they weren't into. So, mm. how I look at it. Let's let's talk about um, Barbara Unleashed, and you know the um, comics I'm looking at here. Um, I'm kicking right now. Is it finished? It, it, that one is finished. We're going to be going to Kickstarter with my kids' book. Uh, we do have. I'm waiting for one person to respond to me so I can send out the uh, the Barbara stuff. But we sent out a lot of the PDFs. A lot of people have the books already because, of course, with what's mm. going on, you can't really go to the post office every day. 
So you got to yeah. kind of pick your trips. You know, I want to have one trip. Everything goes out. Uh, everyone, yeah. I always deliver my books. I have a great track record with that. But Barbara yeah. Unleashed, if, for those who don't know, and I don't know how big it was in Australia, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey was a horrible book about a BDSM relationship. My book is the answer to that. And it is basically about a human being going through finding out that she has a fetish and how it drives her and what it's going to do for the rest of her life. And that's basically, mm. in a nutshell, what it is. But if you go deeper into it, you realize it's not just a story about sex or fetish. It's a well-written story. It's actually mm. deliberately written so people are entertained of all different backgrounds. And that was on purpose. Yeah. And people don't understand that this day and age. They try to write what the reader wants to read. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with it if you give it a good story. And so many people don't write stories and they don't develop characters. Brian K. Morris had called my book a character development book. And I was very um, amazed by that, that that is. And, you know, you, you write more of a you, – Sunspot's going to be more of an adult-geared book, so you know the uphill battle that can be. Yeah, I think um, especially when you're writing drama and it's not so much action-based, I think you have to really develop your characters – with a lot more background, with a bit, a uh, lot more depth than you just like punching things, right? Or you're flying through the air and you don't have to worry about too much of that. And um, so what got you um, thinking, um, what, where did you get this idea to do, Barbara? To be honest with you, Barbara, all comes from just the fact that, again, New York Comic Con, having to write a book, the challenge was out there. So I figured I could write this book about a young woman's journey and at the same time i'd already written a non-fiction kind of book about the bdsm culture i hated it it read like stereo instructions to me because i hadn't i tried to view it as an objective person and not a story driven person and it really came out horribly so yes. i started to write this short story and i said well what if i took this short story and i actually made it into a comic book and that's how we got barbara unleashed and that's how we're now dealing with it so I think we're doing a good job. Go ahead. I was thinking like my first interaction with BDMS was like probably about 2015. And it, it freaked me out because I'd never known anybody to be into this that sort of stuff like slapping, uh, pinching, um, you know, I guess uh, twisting, uh, you know, tw twisting of skin and all that and uh, choking. I was like, if, it was something that was just alien to me because I'd never really seen it happen, you know, and all been part of it. So how do you, you know, so that was my first interaction. So how, how did you, what was your interaction and why, um, to actually when you did the non-fiction story, how did you get involved with that? Well, I was one of those uh, more interesting ones that when my puberty began, that's how I knew puberty began. Because at yeah. the time I was into comics, and in comics there's a lot of girls getting tied up, and yeah. there was a uh, a response, a physical response to seeing girls tied up, and yeah. uh, and mind you, I'm a little older than most. This is back mm. in the '90s, early '90s, like actually, might have been the end of the '80s. That's how old I am. I remember mm. records, kids. That's right. I had a phone that you actually had to spin the wheel like Vanna. Uh, so, you know, like, I, I, I go back a little bit, kids. I, I grew up, I was born when there was a thing called disco. So when <laughs> I found out about this, there was no internet to go yeah. check out what I was into. I had to actually, I was at the, uh, the, the peril of a library, a library that taught me everything that I was into was a deviant thing. And I was dangerous. Mm. Swear to God, I thought I was going to be Joker. I thought I was going to be a villain. I was thinking about how to dye my hair green. I was reading how to start gangs because I'm like, clearly there's something wrong with me, right? You can't talk to anyone. I'm I'm not even 18. I'm well below 18, not even in high school when this is hitting me. Very scary mm -hmm. time of my life. Um, and it took me years to realize there was nothing wrong. The internet was born in 1992. I got to begin to interact with other people. And of course, what do you do when you're young and you go on the internet? The first thing you do is you lie about your age and you act like you're 25. And that's what yeah. I did. And I started to learn that there were names that went along with the things I liked. And mm -hmm. I joined the community because there is a community for the fetish uh, for the fetish uh, in all different areas and uh, different fetishes, of course. And, you know, it, I never forgot how scared I was. And I know there are people out there who are into yeah. it. And I see them at the con all the time. People will come up and you can see that their, their, their hearts racing 
I can see the, the racing. This is men and women because they finally found someone that they can talk to about it because we're, we're mm. fostered in a world that is taught to hate anything that's abnormal. And yeah. this is abnormal. This is not what we do. Meanwhile, what is normal? Like I could rip mm. apart even the vanilla people for yeah. what normal is. And it just, it boggles my mind, but it's the reality. We're in a yeah. world now where we're supposed to accept everyone, except they have a fetish and then they're a joke. Or they're, yeah. kids, you know? Yeah. I think, um, we talked about, uh, you were just talking about like, uh, shades of gray, right? And everybody suddenly was, everybody's into it. And it was like, what do you, because I, from my understanding about BDM is, and, um, also, um, SM and, um, BD, uh, being two different things like uh, Sadio Mercicus and uh, bound, bound bondage and discipline BD. Yep. There so, are so many terms now it can mean. Don't even get stressed on that. You know, just just understand it's all fetish now, and get into exactly right. what you want to talk about. So, thing was that a lot of people, when they think about it, they think it's about control and uh, it's about power over someone, but what i learned was that it was someone actually giving you power giving you control over them not you forcing yourself over them and how do you you know tell us a bit about that um so you know it, it's always the uh the idea and when you get attacked on social media because i did get attacked by um we'll just call them people who don't have a brain so when the people without a brain came to attack me they would say mm -hmm. things like i want to control women and look, I'm not gonna lie. In my book, when you read it, you'll see it is also a warning to people. Yeah. I start off, I bec I always call it, it's my love letter to the fetish community, but it's an honest love letter that brings up the bad right away. Yeah. I wanted to get the bad out of the way. You know, if you want to advocate for something, you have to admit that there's something there that could be dangerous, so you can yeah. have an honest conversation about it. And that's what we began with. We start right away talking about. The, the negativity that can be inherent with this and even the girl being in a position where she's not doing so well and that all comes back to some people do take advantage absolutely but like yeah. you were saying the reality of the situation is this a person decides to put themselves in that peril they yeah. trust someone and give someone power over them when done right there is more com a communication in a uh, BDSM or a fetish relationship than there is in an average vanilla relationship because you have to inherently learn to communicate so everyone yes. gets out the other side feeling okay about what just happened. Because, I mean, even just tying a person up, I remember a couple girls that I was their first foray into uh, bondage, they freaked out, and that was okay. Mm -hmm. And they were untied, and then they wanted to do it again in a little while, maybe a day or a yeah. week, sometimes even an hour or two later. But the first time you realize how, and there's a moment I write in my book with this, the moment you realize how helpless you are, you suddenly become very clear and very focused on the world around you. And you suddenly yeah. realize it. And the girls who freaked out even said, it's not that I don't trust you. It's just, I got scared. And I said, no, you did right. You told me, and that's what you're supposed to do. Like even when this whole consent thing came out and people were like, aren't you worried about as a man not having consent? I was like, no, that's one thing I never have to worry about because yeah. I grew up understanding consent. And I was yeah. the boyfriend who, who asked and over asked and over asked. Because I had yeah. to get that into, that's what I suggest to everyone. And there are a lot of people who run into this. And a lot of people, like, I'm an Uber dom. One of the worst things I ever hear is, and I, I'm not always the most, um, I guess, sheep and follow along with everyone else. So in the BDS yeah. community, you're supposed to ask a woman if she's available to talk or do I have to talk to their dominant. Again, yeah. I have to ask another human being if I have to talk to you? No, I don't. And there's this thing in the community that's my kink is not your kink. Yeah. And for a long time, people were like, no, that's just showing respect. I was like, no, that's not showing respect. That's your kink, not mine. Showing respect is talking to her like she's a human being. And yeah. if she told me that, oh, well, oh, well you know, you, you have to ask someone to talk to me, honestly, I would just stop talking to her because yeah. that's I, I would see that she doesn't want to be engaged in a conversation. And I've even had someone come over to me and be like, well, I'm her dom. Did you ask me permission? And I'm like, I'm Rob. I don't ask anyone permission except the person I'm talking to. And she had the ability to walk away. 
and mm -hmm. I don't ask permission to be in a conversation with someone, they either talk or they walk yeah. away. And this is adult time. So I do see that disconnect where people take it a little mm -hmm. too far. You know, there's the people who are like, oh, she's my slave 24 seven. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I mean, you were always in a relationship and yes, things can go. But when you, you start talking for a person and making decisions for a person, that's dangerous for yeah. any relationship. And there are even books that talk about how it can go too far. So when, when I built this book, it wasn't about preaching about every, trying to convert everyone to fetish. In fact, it was me explaining to people who don't have a fetish what it is. It's an insightful yeah. world they might understand. My editor was blown away when he realized, wait a minute, you guys go to classes? You guys have real deep conversations. You guys talk about methodology and you talk about the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. He's like, honestly, I just started having sex. I didn't even think for one time that I needed to have a class. And, you know, he was even shocked at some of this. And this, this might be a shock to some of your viewing audience. Sometimes there is no sex involved with fetish or BDSM. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it is just the act itself that is pleasurable to both parties in, in involved in. That goes back to why I always say that I think BDSM or fetish, because a fetish is something that is, if for those who have a fetish, not the people who tell you they have a foot fetish. No, if you have a foot fetish or a shoe fetish, it is an obsession almost. It can mm. become dangerous if you don't watch it. It is an addiction, but it has something to do with your sexuality. Even mm. if you're not, not to, not to be vulgar, but even if you're not finishing, you are still enjoying the act, and there is a physical response in your body, same as there might be from a uh, runner's high or jumping out of an airplane, but now you're doing it with a person, and it's that connection mm. you talked about. It's that person being, I trust you, you can do this to yeah. me, that is empowering to a real dominant. A fake dominant wants to pretend that they can control a human being, which we all know is ugly and should never be done. Yeah. This is what I, this is what I found when, in my first uh, foray into that. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a couple of times now, was it? But, and it was very vanilla, right? Compared to what I'm aware of now, um, having looked into it to a certain degree. But the idea that that person was, the other person was always in control. It would be like, okay, that's enough. Move on to the next bit. Now this, then I'm like, yep. Are you okay? Yep. And it was this really, it's a very, very enlightening, yet uh, pleasurable, yet, you know, enjoyable moment because it felt like it was just that you were both free for, you know, for the first time I was like, this is, I'm, I'm free. Not because I had a fetish, because she had a fetish, and yet I was allowed to be part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it just felt like, okay, I can just be myself and she's being herself, so I'm not. So both of us were comfortable in each other's space. Is that, you know, is that sort of a norm that you think that people um, come to in this? Um, you know, is that sort of, I, what am I trying to say here? Uh, that whole sub, um, submission um, thing, um, allowing someone to have that, how does somebody get to that? Like, I mean, like, I know in normal relationships, people don't actually, they don't actually tell each other the truth about themselves as much as they do with, uh, say, in the BDM BDMS or, you know, having a fetish or kink because your partner is also involved in that sometimes. Or do they, you know, is it is it easier to meet someone in that environment or actually introduce someone to that environment, do you think? Um. That's an interesting question, and it's it's. Uh, I pre I preface this by saying it it is about an individual. Not mm. everyone can fit in what I'm about to say, but as a general, just personal experience over a lifetime, um, it is easy. It is easier to introduce someone to it if they are into it. If they are mm. not into it, it's one of the worst things that you can do to try to introduce something because then they might try to go along and fake it. Uh, finding mm. people who are already mm. in it is ideal because then there is less um, awkwardness at the beginning, but I don't mm. mind the awkwardness. Um, I have uh, helped people without even being involved with them and kind of talk them through and try to help them figure out what they're into. Mm. Uh, I've done that for a few people. Um, that's called mentoring. Uh, yeah. So I've 
done that for a few few people, both men and women, believe it or not. That's not because it's not a relationship that's sexual, so it doesn't matter who I'm mentoring. Uh, yeah. There are, I guess, basically, there, there has to be a desire for it. And if you yeah. try to force someone to do something they're not into or open to, because you can still be open to trying something new and it can still be a great experience. Mm. But if you just randomly pick someone up and try to force them into it, that'll never work. But also, I have a lot of friends, and down here in Florida, there is slim pickings, and it's harder to find people who are into it. But I think it's like you said. It's not that there aren't people into it. It's that we're taught to, shh, we don't talk about that, especially yeah. in America. Oh, my God, America cannot deal with sexuality. It's a giant children's uh, reaction to everything. Oh, they said boobs. Oh, my God, we're talking about people having sex. Oh, how we can't talk about that. Oh, my God, my virgin ears. And yet we have Viagra commercials on in the middle of the morning when kids are <laughs> So just go figure out America and let me know because I haven't figured it out yet. Well, the, um, before I go into, um, go into that one, um, Jerry Ryan, do you remember Jerry Ryan when she um, and her partner? The situation where he was forcing her to go to certain things that she just didn't want to and they had a big case about that. Yeah. How... Um, that, that's that's the one time I, I kind of thought like, well, that doesn't seem right that where a person's forcing somebody something, and the other person is not into it, and that's not really what this is about, is it? No, that's actually the reverse. I mean, you and here it is: um, people want everyone to be into what they're into. It's just true. We see it on Facebook all the time. Everyone expects this echo chamber. But you have to be realistic. And I say this to all, the, all the time to people when I'm dating. Um, are I, I'm very open about it. I Right away, I'm into the fetish community. I have a fetish mm -hmm. for bondage. I explain what that is. Now having a comic book is really easy. I hand my comic books and go read these, and you'll understand yeah. things more. I'll give them it as a PDF. So when they're reading it, if they don't come in contact with me again, I get it. No problem. No yeah. harm. No foul. You don't understand. It's not for you. The people who do show up, I would never expect them to do things. Of course, there are certain things you like. I would want them to come with me to a fetish club and try it out one night and just see it. Like you want people to be involved in your life, but if someone was like, "I'm yeah. not into this," then I would be like, "Then we can't be together." And I have ended yeah. relationships over that, but that's just being honest, as opposed to being like, "No, you're going to grow to like this. This isn't food. This isn't the way you cook. It's not getting used to it. This is about someone inherently having to be comfortable with something." That is an intimate moment, and you have yeah. to understand that this is about intimacy. It's not about sexuality, but it is about intimacy. And not mm -hmm. everyone's going to feel intimate about the same things you feel intimate about. You have to be mm -hmm. honest about that. How many people do you know? I know I know a lot of people in the wrong relationships with people who just stay in it because they're afraid to be single. I'd rather mm -hmm. die alone than be with the wrong person. That's just who mm -hmm. I am, and I'm okay with being alone. I don't want to be I, I, I left my partner because of that. Yeah. Wrong, just wrong thing. After nine years, like, no, this isn't working. Yeah, you know, and you, you yeah. say, good luck, and you go your own way. Exactly. That was basically it. Yeah, you, know, you got a life. I got a life. Let's go separate. Otherwise, we won't be happy anymore. And it was got to that point where we weren't happy. Yeah. And it was just after my accident. It was like you, you, you know, you get to realize what sort of person someone is when you're in the dire straits of your life and struggling and. Yeah, yeah. So, you get to so, see the real person when you're down and out. You get to see everyone around how they treat you. Because I'm sure you got the people looking down at you like you were damaged goods. And yeah. you're like, oh, man, when I come back up, you'll never know what happened and you won't be here for it. Yeah. The other thing was uh, talking about that, like, I mean, going into this, a week into going to lockdown, we're in our fourth month, uh, fourth week now here in New Zealand. I said to my uh, my um, my PA, uh, my um my friend, who's, uh, who's partners with me in the business, I said to him, you know, in this, going to this, you'll find out who your friends are, you know, who, who are going to stick with you and stuff. And we, and this is, it's really telling how people react in a dire situation like this, where you can't leave your home and, you know, whether, you know, trying to connect with people who are, who are not superficial anymore, you know, because you, it was like, this is, the connection time where you have to spend the time you have to get to with people and you have to learn a lot more about people in stress and crisis did you did you find that 
Um, well, I mean, also there's our own personal stuff we're going through. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of us have had to become teachers and we weren't ever educated to be a teacher. It's a very hard thing. Um, yeah. Depression is very common for creative types to begin with. Yeah. And to, to have this bleak future has been very trying on other people. Um, mm -hmm. I have tried to be a voice, as always I have, of the middle ground and of reason. Everything I say, I try to think it out. I try not to respond to things emotionally as much as I can. Um, yeah. I am, a, I am a, a ferocious debater, and I expect nothing but facts. But in the end of the day, I, I want to hear facts. Show me the information. So I, yeah. I've been a lot more like that, but I've also reached out to a lot of people, and in private I've had some very personal conversations. Mm -hmm. And again, people are scared. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little scared. I'm not scared yeah. necessarily about getting sick, but I'm scared about my family getting sick. I have family yeah. in New York. I have friends in New York. Around here in Florida, we have the same thing going on. We have numbers. No one's really telling us a real honest truth. We're getting bits and drabs of guesses, and it's terrifying. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. You guys are supposed to know better. I'm not supposed to know better. You're supposed to know better. And right now, you're telling me, wear the face mask. Don't wear the face mask. Hand sanitizer. Yeah. Don't use too much hand sanitizer. It's bad. Make up your mind. You're driving me crazy. It's like asking a woman where to go get food. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, I made the joke. But in my life, it's not a joke. I have dealt with yeah. that many times. But no, realistically, right now is a great time to reach out. And I've reached out to every person. I, I Randomly, I reach out to people I haven't even talked to in like months. How you doing? Are you okay? My mm -hmm. friends are doing the same with me. They see me in a video. They see I'm a little down. Like I was upset. Um, and this is and this is a good moment. I can't remember what I was upset about. Remember mm -hmm. that after it's done, it's harder to remember. But for some reason, I was really upset, and I can't remember why. But like I had mm -hmm. friends reach out to me and go, "Hey, you know, I know this is hard. I know you've been, you know, doing all this online stuff, and I know mm -hmm. you're pushing yourself hard because you know, like you, there are days I'm in a lot of pain, and I can't even go on yeah. camera." Because I mean, my eyes are all puffy from the pain. I don't look physically well. I might be in my bed doing some of these shows, and I don't tell anyone that because I don't want anyone feeling bad for me. I fucking hate yeah. people feeling bad for me. I try not to get anyone to feel bad for me. I'm not here. Yeah, your pity Olympics. That's not what I'm doing. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't like that. I don't want to be looked down on. So I hide a lot of times what's going on. Mm -hmm. but I don't talk about it. like when I first announced that I was getting a divorce. People were like, "Well, how far along are you?" I'm like, no, we're, we're signing the papers that's happening next month. They're like, how long has this been going on? I'm like, oh, a year. And they're like, you yeah. can't do that. You can't not talk to people. I'm just used to that, though. I don't try to burden other people with my stuff. But yeah. I've had friends now who have learned that they check in with me and they go, no, seriously, how are you doing? So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful in that regard. I've had people checking in with me. I've been checking in with people. I've seen a lot of great humanity. There's some ugly yeah. on the Internet. There's always going to be ugly on the Internet. There's always going to be ugly people. This is a great opportunity to just go unfriend, unfriend, unfollow, unfriend, unfollow, yeah. and get your your not a bubble that's an echo. I, I that's a dangerous thing all itself. You don't want people who agree with you, but you don't mm -hmm. want ugly. God hates ugly, and so should you. You know, and that's just how I feel about it. You know, don't mm -hmm. allow ugly people in your life because they'll drag you down. There are things that'll make you mad breathe and realize that they're a small part of the universe. It doesn't matter what they do. They'll never be yep. part of the universe. And just realize yeah. that. Remember, you know, this life, don't take it too serious. You're not going to get out alive. It's true. We're going to make the best of what we can right now. Yeah. Um, let's do, you've got some, like, with Bar Unleash, you've got PG. Let's, let's talk about some of those. We talk about um, the more content, but you've got some children's you said that's coming out. Tell us about that. Cat Dad and Supermom. Um, it's a, actually a story about my little boy. Ha it actually is. I based it on my son, and uh, I based it on the idea that when he goes to sleep, he dreams of the problems he has, and he tries mm -hmm. to figure them out. And this recent issue, he gets to see – a lunch lady get bullied by his friends. And what don't we talk about bullying? We talk about how it feels to be bullied. We talk about the bullies, but we never talk about what we should do when we see bullying. And I mm. want to address that. So the, in the thing, Jax definitely sees his friends bully this poor lunch lady. And this lunch lady was just trying to wear these goofy glasses where it has a nose that, that looks like an elephant. And it's all this just trying to make kids smile. And these kids are just nasty to her because some of the kids nowadays are just nasty little demons. 
And uh, when the principal asks him, hey, what, what happened there? The Jax goes, oh, I don't know. I was thinking about something else. I wasn't paying attention. And that mm-hmm. bothers him. So he comes home and he talks to me. And in his dream, and I, I tell him, you have to do what's right, not what's popular. And so when he goes to dream, uh, dream that night after he falls asleep, I come alive as cat dad, his mom is super mom, and his uncle is uh, potato butt. And they go to take on this over strong elephant, Ella Fart, who uses her fart gas as like a green lantern ring and makes shapes. And they go to, a, to, to battle her, and I won't spoil what happens at the end, but yeah. in the dream, he discovers the answer to what he should do. And I think it's a powerful moment. And the important thing about writing this was it was written for everyone. So no matter your age, I have had 40-year-olds who are like, that was amazing. I've had people in the industry who've been in the industry for 20 years who are like, wow, that was really well done. That's a professional book. Like, way to go. Like, this was the book that leveled me up. Like, everyone's been proud of Barbara Unleashed in the story, but this one, just something about it has resonated with everyone who's read it. I have not had anyone read it without having a response and actually them responding to me and saying, like, I didn't have to prompt them. I didn't have to ask. They would come up to me and go, wow, that was good. So I knew I did something right. The problem, of course, will be the next issue, trying to recapture that magic and trying to get yeah to believe you know what you're doing when it comes to writing so so you this is the first one you've got you're doing like a series or just yeah, just um this will be an ongoing series uh the original origin of it started with jacks which mm-hmm. was a different story and uh like things in indie comics this was meant to be something that it turned out not to be um we were going to make a coloring book and then The artist wound up getting his wife pregnant, and it was good news, and they had twins, and then things got put off to the side. Next thing you know, we lose contact with each other. He starts his own comic book series. The Brown family does a great job with it. I'm left with this this story that I really enjoyed, but I wanted to do more with it. And Originally, my my part of the book was going to be kind of mine to use later, but first we were going to develop this whole thing about all the creators' kids, and we were going to do... Uh, kids of cons, you know, kids that show up at comic cons. Mm -hmm. I really liked the idea, but it fell apart. But I had this lying around and I'm like, I really like this too much to just give up on it. So um, I talked to Rahil, who uh, is a great artist, and he was bored one day and he's like, I want to work with you. And I'm like, cool. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what do you like about everything I created? And he's like, well, tell me about that kid's story, the Jack story. So I told him about it. He's like, that's such a great idea that the kid's imagination does that. He's like, you know, you want to do like a quick two page story? So we did. And he loved working with me. I loved working with him. And we signed up to do an entire issue. We brought Chuck on and Chuck become, became invaluable in, in whatever the word is. Uh, he became very important to the, uh, the, the process. And we wound up making him a co-creator. And uh, Rahil is a co-creator. So it's the three of us. Rahil brought in some new ideas. Chuck brought in a passion for it and helped us keep on track. So, yeah, this will be a series that on goes, which we were supposed to have started. But, again, the world is upside down right now. So things have kind of gotten pushed and moved around. Uh, we will be getting to it hopefully sometime this year. We go to Kickstarter and hopefully raise enough money to start that next issue. Hmm. But it is a fully developed book. Like, this is this is not a, a undone book. As you guys can see, it's fully done. Is there a hole in there in the cover? Is there a hole in the cover? No, 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 it's shiny. Oh, right. It looks like there was like a, where the egg or something is. It looks like there's a hole when you actually move it. No, no, it's just a shiny cover. So then you got All right. some great art inside. It's a great mm. book, and um, I'm excited about it. And we won an award for the Independent Creator Awards last year. Did not expect wow. it. I uh, was very impressed by it, and this was something that was brought together. We, we hosted it in Indie Advocates, but it became bigger than Indie Advocates, became its own thing. And we had hundreds of submissions, thousands of votes. And uh, it was a powerful moment because this got picked by other creators. And I didn't put it in. Chuck did. And because I was involved, I couldn't have anything to do with it. And we wound up winning. And I remember we were behind Mm -hmm. the scenes doing the the audit for the awards. And suddenly there was that moment like, okay, Kat, that and Supermom wins. And it just clicked in me like, wait, I just won an award from my peers. Mm -hmm. My peers decided 
that this book was better than some great competition blown away that it was like it wasn't like a a close victory it was like hey there could be one person who might cause a problem but for the most part yeah. Captain supermom wins and there were uh several votes on on that particular category and it was like by great people who i i even looked up to and they were like nope that was it nope that was it you know, and I was blown away, and there were two people who voted for two other stories, so they were just one mm -hmm. one vote. So we 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 were blown away. Me and Chuck, because he was the auditor, was like, "Wow, I can't believe we actually won!" And that was like a very powerful moment for me and him. I think because we'd realized all that hard work had paid off, and until that moment, I never realized how important awards were. But having mm -hmm. gotten an award now, it's like, no, that really is. So that's why we're gonna put. The award on the cover and have a special printed edition with the award on the cover to celebrate our victory because it's a well-earned victory yeah so um you've got this one then you've got a new have you, is this a and the second one's going to be the new a new kickstarter or no that we're going to be kickstarting this book because we tried kickstarting it two times before it never successfully funded and mm -hmm. we wound up doing a beta issue and then this flip book issue but we actually don't have it as a single issue right now. And I was going to originally leave it when we had the second issue. But now that we've won the award, now that we're in the middle of this C-19, and I'm like, you know what? I believe in this book. And I just, I think I screwed up the Kickstarters. I wasn't passionate enough about it. Because I created Barber Unleashed, I was afraid to have my name on it. There was bad marketing because of it. And during the other campaign, the two campaigns I ran were very bad with it. it there were problems i'd lost my voice during one of the campaigns and just could not talk i actually injured my vocal cords so both of them i mean now going into a third one i'm nervous a little bit like what's going to go wrong now but i figured c19 covers the bad so i might be okay with this one i think that i might just yeah. skim under because we're already dealing with enough bad that that'll be it but i'm very passionate about um children reading comic books so they can be not only our fans for tomorrow, but just be part of the conversation. I, I want to invite children yeah. back in and families. I want families to be able to be pick, pick up a comic book, sit down and read it with their kid and not feel like the content is at all going to hurt anyone's values. Yeah. I think that's, that's basically what we did for Punch, right? We put up our own little convention and the whole, even today I had to fill out a form for some funding, uh, possible funding. And it was like, tell us about your project. And I said, well, Comics to be used edu education for future art, uh, movie, TV, and uh, entertainment creators. That's basically it, you know, and to help them get out of their head for mental health. That's the reason we put the co convention up. But then on the side, I'll just create my comics, <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep playing with my comics and magazines. But I think that that first introduction, I mean, all of us had that, right? The first introduction to comics, how it blew us away and made us look at the pictures and go, what is those words on here? What are they saying? And I think if we, yeah, if you, if you can bring that back to the kids again, you know, rather than be making them confused about what's going on, it's going to be just amazing. You know, I, you know, I guess that's what the guys saw, the awards people saw that this is what your book was doing. And yeah. So when are you looking at kicking, starting this? Is there a date set or? Wednesday. We're going live Wednesday. We're, Wednesday? Ready moved. We're already ready to go. Got a couple Excellent. more videos to film. I actually have to get going in just a few minutes to actually start. Yeah, filming. I was just looking at the time. Just thought right. I asked the right the Where, eight questions. Right. Let me get this done. Where so Wednesday. Wednesday it goes live. Probably around Brian K. Morris's 10 a.m. show. So I have an official show to announce it during. Because I like to announce it while a show is live. And I don't want it to be my news. Because when you're running a website, you don't want to be covering yourself. You want other people to be covering you. And I always stress that to people. Even if you have your own marketing campaign, get with other people and have them market for you. And, yeah. and it's always easier. And even for me, it's easier for me to advocate for other people because then people are like, hey, he's just a fan. And I always feel yeah. more awkward about me advocating for myself because I feel like I'm asking for money. But in this case, I feel empowered by it because I realize it's won an award. And if, if I can't scream from rooftops up for it, then who will? And I have to. I have to get passionate. I have to get loud. And I have to let people know this is a book you need to own because it's great for you and your kids. And even if you have a niece and nephew or if you just like funny stuff, I mean, there is literally a train that is made of farts that says words on it. It's amazing. And it proves yeah. the words can hurt you. Do I need to say anything more? 
Excellent. So, um, for us here in New Zealand, it'll, it won't be tomorrow. It'll be the day after tomorrow, even though tomorrow is our Wednesday, because we're a day ahead of you guys. So It'd be two days from now. Yeah. And you can watch cool. the Kickstarter pause. Um, that'll be on Thursday for you guys mm. early in the morning, because we do it around or my time would be, I think we're doing, I have to check. I actually have to send out an email in a few minutes to the guest. And just check in with them. But I believe we're going live at 2 o'clock, which would make it 6 a.m. for you guys. Yeah. 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 Give that time, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. I hope, yeah. It's, it'll be on a watch party, so I'll probably sh be able to share it on our site. So that'll be cool. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Rob, for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, getting me involved in doing this thing. Because I think I mentioned at the start, but if you guys are just watching it now, it was actually Rob that got me thinking about how, how to use StreamYard and use StreamYard for our broadcast, which has made it so much, much better and easier for me to work with my friends around the place. Thank you so much, bud. And thank you and all the best for your Wednesday release. Um, I, how, what's the price on it? Like, what, what are you um, thinking it for? Um, uh, the, we're going to go real cheap with the digital, actually. I think we're going to keep it at $2. I understand things are tough right now, and we want people to have the access to it. One dollar will get you uh, a preview. Two dollars gets you the actual book, and that's how many pages? Uh, Thirty, thirty-two. This comes in at thirty-two pages. That's pretty good because that's like a pay, uh, comic and a half. Isn't it? Yep, and it's just going to be two bucks. We get it. for money. Yeah, if you can afford the physical copies, we'll have the physical copies. We're keeping our goal real low. It'll be two fifty. We're not looking for a lot of money. I would love to make a good amount of money on this, but I don't want to shake anyone upside down. So we're starting with a moderate goal, and we'll continue to crowdfund and raise money as we go up. If we have to add a cover, I'll reach out to some friends, ask friends if they want to do an extra cover. But I'm trying to keep it bare bones so people can invest and feel like they're not being asked for the bells and whistles. Personally, I'm not going for bells and whistles. I'm not going to do a T-shirt. I'm not trying to take any more money than people are willing to give. I'd be happy yeah. if they just buy a book. Even if it's a digital $2 copy, I'd be happy with that. Excellent. Cool. Um, all the best, and thank you for your time, man. I really appreciate it. I know we, you've got heaps on your plate, and especially with the Kickstarter, and amazing time. Thank you for your, you know, discussing BDMSM, because I hadn't really thought about that's what we were going to be discussing, but what a wicked thing to talk about in a good way and a pleasant way. Thank you so much for your time, man. Appreciate right. it. Thank you.